Again, my name is Ernie Wong. I'm one of the founding principals of uh, Site Design Group based in Chicago. Uh, this year, we are celebrating our 30th year in business. What a year it's been. Uh, we never anticipated that, uh, you know, this year we would be, we were hoping that we'd have huge celebrations, big parties, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that certainly is not happening, but we're learning how to cope with a lot of different things um, in, in how we do business and how we continue to uh, involve ourselves in, in civic duty. Um, I do want to let you know that in, in addition to my uh, responsibilities as uh, what as a head of our firm. Um, I do sit on a number of other uh, committees and, and uh, I sit on four, gee, five not-for-profit organizations, including the, um, uh, the uh, City Parks Alliance, as, as well as a number of other uh, uh, national and local uh, not-for-profits. And I also stay, uh, serve on the uh, City of Chicago's Landmarks Commission as well, and I've been doing that since 2008. Uh, so it's been, you know, part of my, my uh, of who I am is, is actually doing civic duty. So I really appreciate the things that, that you guys have to deal with. Um, a little bit about us. Our firm right now is, uh, I, I notice, uh, noted that we're 30 years in business. Uh, we have 28 people uh, on staff right now, which is about a small to mid-sized firm for a design firm. Uh, we're designing parks and streetscapes and a number of things, uh, public spaces throughout the city of Chicago and all, all over the country now. Um, just a bit about ourselves, we, we like to pride ourselves on the diversity of our, uh, of our firm. And when I mention diversity, that really is about cultural diversity. We have folks from all over the world, uh, as you notice in this slide, 11 languages spoken from all over Asia, uh, Korea, um, uh, Japan, uh, China. Uh, we also have folks from South Africa. We have folks from Australia. Um, so it is a, it's really an interesting uh, um, dynamic and especially with the young folks who are bringing incredible ideas uh, to our to our uh, firm. Um, the also the other thing that I will say is that uh, to the bottom right, uh, that is when I say that the dog ate our homework. Uh, that's for real. The dog ate our homework. Um, I told you about these uh, the amount of uh, work we do in the public way. Uh, we have. We have done a couple of shared streets, which means that there are no curbs and gutters uh, on these streets. They are open to both pedestrians and vehicular uh, spaces. Uh, we've done the first ones in the state of Illinois. This is up in Argyle Street uh, in the north side of Chicago, as well as on the south side, the Prairie Avenue streetscape, uh, which has uh, just been involved with the new McCormick uh, Convention Center, which is now uh, pretty empty right now. Um, but it is in the middle of a neighborhood. We also do all kinds of different, uh, what they call uh, tactical urban treatments. This was a project that we did for $150,000 on uh, one of the toughest intersections in Chicago um, in trying to deal with some of the pedestrian flow, uh, as well as um, uh, some of the interchange work that we're doing uh, for the state. So this is the Jane Byrne interchange uh, that is ongoing and continues to ongo uh, in Chicago for the next few years. Um, we also get involved with a number of higher education and institutional work. Uh, this is Western Illinois. We did the master plan for their uh, new campus in Moline. Uh, the University of Chicago uh, providing pedestrian walkways throughout their entire uh, campus. Uh, Field Museum of Natural History, we redid their entire uh, landscape around their building to kind of give their, uh, their mission, uh, take that outside. They are the Field Museum of Natural History. Uh, they had nothing but lawn there before and now they're all native plants and, and a learning center outside. Uh, we also get involved with a number of other projects, such as um, uh, private developments, as uh, 
the rooftop amenities that we've been doing all over the country, as well as affordable housing projects that we have uh, been uh, really active in, in terms of uh, developing those spaces. The parks, though, are something that we really have uh, been have been a focus of ours. We have done parks throughout the city of Chicago and now actually uh, throughout the country. Uh, we're doing a number of them in Cincinnati and uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Kansas City. Uh, this is the park at Lakeshore East, which is um, uh, one of the new developments on a 28-acre site uh, uh, on the north side of Chicago. Uh, and Mary Bartlemay Park, which actually was uh, in um, industrial area prior to this park being built. And now this park is now the icon for that uh, uh, for that neighborhood, that residential mixed-use neighborhood. Um, Henry Paul Masano Park is a, uh, used to be a landfill. This was uh, one of the parks that um, the city took over and uh, it was, uh, they use it for a, a construction waste. So uh, nothing toxic, nothing uh, uh, environmentally sensitive, uh, but we turned this into a 27 acre wetland and prairie enclave, you walk into this park, you have no idea you're in the city of Chicago. And then uh, Ping Tom Memorial Park is some of our riverfront work that we have done uh, along the city, uh, along the Chicago River. Um, and this is, again, is an 18 acre park that sits in the heart of Chinatown. This one actually was really kind of an interesting place because it became the uh, final destination of the amazing race, the sixth season nobody knew how to find it. So it was uh, quite interesting to see that. Uh, we just finished last year, the Riverwalk East, uh, actually two years ago. This was uh, Mayor Emanuel's uh, last request of us. Uh, six months before he left office, he said, I need this park, the part of the river uh, designed and built uh, by May when I leave office. And I said, sir, it is, um, it's November and we are in the city of Chicago. You understand that uh, this construction is gonna have to happen no, during the winter. And he said, yep, I understand that, let's get going. And uh, we, we were able to achieve that. And now this is actually part of the extension of the, uh, the river walk, which has uh, become made uh, one of the new uh, uh, tourist areas within the city of Chicago and really um, celebrating the Chicago river. As I mentioned, we are now all over the country. Um, last week, as of last week, actually, we picked up a, pro a project in, uh, in California, another one in Texas, our new project in Houston, and a project in Norfolk, Virginia. So uh, we're, we're reaching out to you guys all over the place as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we are seeing a new uh, set of challenges uh, in the way we do business. I have spent 30 years of my career in building public spaces to bring people together. And now that's kind of just been thrown out of the window, right? We have to deal with um, uh, social distancing. We have to deal with uh, some of the issues of, of, uh, of sanitation, of, you know, the things that we, we really took for granted. And it's been interesting to see what that has done, you know, in terms of the economics of the city, uh, the economics that you guys are dealing with as well, uh, how do we bring those businesses back and how do we start to deal with some of these issues of social distancing within public spaces? On top of that, we are dealing with, uh, you know, some of the civil unrest that's been occurring in all of our cities, and uh, which is, you know, it, it's, it's an issue that we're gonna, uh, we deal with, and you know, I'm old enough to remember uh, the 1968 uh, 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 riots in in Chicago. Uh, uh, 26 years later, the Rodney King uh, riots in in uh, in Los Angeles, and and another 24 years later, and here we are with Black Lives Matter talking about the same thing we talked about 50 years ago. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping that. Uh, this uh, inequity that uh, challenges us all is going to continue to be a discussion uh, and we've got to deal with that and we've got to continue to uh, encourage the, uh, the folks to be able to come to the table and talk to each other. 
Um, you know, and this is the kind of things that we, we all have to deal with. Uh, this, is, this is a shot from Minneapolis. Um, uh, we are not doing work in Minneapolis, but looking to do work in Minneapolis. Uh, but it is certainly uh, one of those challenges that we uh, all uh, have to look at, we have to deal with, and, and, um, and we're trying to find some solutions. So where do we go from here? Um, one of the things that we've been thinking about is, are these park spaces and the green spaces throughout our cities? We're lucky here in Chicago to have this, uh, this set of greenways that connect some of the major parks throughout the city of Chicago, um, throughout the boulevard uh, system. So there are wide green spaces that uh, typically have been used for excess park spaces. And we're starting to look at this as, you know, a little bit more functional than just recreational area. When we start to look at um, how people are traveling now, we're seeing more bikes on the road. We're seeing people uh, trying to figure out other forms of transportation to, uh, to get to and from, you know, when, when we reopen, how they get to work and how do they travel to uh, get to other parts of the city. Uh, so, you know, we're lucky here in Chicago to have that. Boston has the same kind of situation uh, with their emerald necklace uh, that connects some of their major parks. So if we start to look at these, these, uh, uh, these greenways as ways for people to travel and not be obstructed by vehicular traffic, uh, that's another way to start to enhance uh, those, uh, those, that park space. Uh, and along the way, it starts to enhance how people start to utilize those parks as well. So that's something to continue to keep in mind. The next item I wanted to talk about were outdoor workspaces. You know, I was thinking about this, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to feel a lot more safe uh, doing things outdoors. Our, our, the, your constituents are finding that, you know, they need to take a break from the shelter at home, they go outside, uh, they try to get a little bit of exercise. But for the most part, I mean, people, as soon as they get outside, they feel a lot safer because we all know that the, this virus uh, has a harder time uh, uh, traveling when you're outdoors and the wind is blowing, etc. Uh, I want to show this photo because this is not a new idea of how we start to use outdoor spaces. Uh, the nomadic tribes, the Russian, Le uh, the Roman legions, uh, all did this when they were uh, invading other uh, countries and uh, when they were traveling around, they would all pitch a tent and they would hold their offices on the indoors. And we're starting to see this now with the COVID testing sites. I mean, we're sort of, this is a smart thing to do. You use the outdoors as an office space, as a testing space in this particular case. Um, and there's some really create, kind of creative ways to, to, to do this. So you have so much open space and parkland at your disposal and, and trying to figure out how to use, utilize this. This is an interesting way to start to look at those spaces and say, you know, is there an area that we can start to designate as, uh, as uh, basically outdoor offices? And if you start to patch all those together, then it becomes a district. And so we started thinking about that and, and what does that start to look like? And we take our cues from, you know, the cabanas that we have all uh, seen, you know, around the swimming pool and people want a little bit of privacy. But if you can imagine this, you know, this is the living room outside, but you put in a desk and voila, this is what you get. You get an outdoor space, you put the Wi-Fi there, you're able to put a whiteboard up, uh, you're able to, to do a whole lot of things in the outdoors, people feel a little bit safer, but they're able to communicate and provide workspaces that may be an, an asset to your uh, uh, park space. You could also do this in parking lots as well. Easy to do. That's one example. Here's another example, kind of a pop-up office. Uh, we see examples like this and we're like, wow, that's really amazing. You can, you can get up, you can transport this around, drop it down, pop up these spaces, and, and here you go. Uh, kind of like the, the, the things that we've been seeing with container uh, storage uh, spaces that have been going around. Uh, this is, that's another idea that can start to work 
uh, as as low cost but uh, um, efficient ways to have people working out outdoors. It, you could rent that space out. You could do all kinds of creative kind of things. How did this all kind of come about? And I got to tell you that one of the things that, you know, I sit around, I stay up at night and I'm like, how do you start to make a little bit more money? And so I started thinking about this. Whoops, hang on. I'm going a little bit too fast here. There we go. I can't get to that. Here we go. So this is what I was thinking about. I kept on thinking about all the porta potties that you have to put up during festivals. I started thinking about if you pimped out a trailer and you did this luxury bathroom, how much would people pay to, to, to use this bathroom? And I started to do this little poll. I was out at uh, one of these music festivals a few years ago and people were like, yeah, I would pay up to $5 to use one of these bathrooms. And I was like, what a, what a great idea. If you put a couple double wides there, you pimp these, uh, these, these, uh, these uh, trailers out, you put in the most luxurious bathrooms around, you make sure they're clean, here you go. And you start to base everything around that, your whole business district, everything else. All the amenities that you need are actually within your reach. Next item is the structured play. We're so used to this in our playgrounds right now. Uh, structured play is, is uh, one of those things that facilitates how kids get outdoors and how they exercise, how they deal with, uh, you know, recreation and things that they can, they can uh, apply to. And one of the things that the playground equipment manufacturers do is they divide up playground equipment between the one to five years old uh, group and the five to 12 year old group. And they say, oh, keep those groups apart. Make sure that they are uh, kind of separated because you don't want anybody getting hurt. But at the same time, we, you, you start to realize, well, a lot of that is so they can sell more equipment. Um, and we did this park in the, in the middle of the West Loop in Chicago, where we actually ignored that, that, uh, that, uh, that suggestion. And we ended up putting, um, uh, just equipment wherever we thought it was going to be uh, possible, whether it be, uh, whether it be for older kids or for younger kids. And one of the things that we found is that the older kids were actually uh, teaching the younger kids how to use stuff. And we actually started seeing intergenerational kind of activity as well. We started to see the grandmothers and the nannies and everything else starting to play in the playground equipment. So the structured play is actually really exciting. It's something that I think is necessary, but you'll find also that one of the things in this day and age of social distancing, that structured play is the thing that kids kind of clamor to. And, and, and it's exciting, but you got to keep this stuff clean. You got to make sure that it is, uh, uh, you know, available to all these kids and, and uh, uh, continue to utilize it in a, in a very uh, methodical way. Um, and, and which is all wonderful and fun. But we've been experimenting with a couple of other things on how kids play. And that is a system of what I'm gonna call nature play. So nature play, we've started to do a few uh, of these all over the country of using natural materials as play areas. And this starts to spread kids out a little bit more. I mean, so they don't cluster around a single and a piece of play equipment, they're actually exploring, doing a lot more exploration. This is, you know, for a lot of you, when, you know, if you, when you guys were growing up and when I was growing up, you would go out and you would kind of imagine all your different things. I remember telling my kids, oh, you don't know, you don't need all these toys. All you need is a ball stick in a box. I actually still believe that. It is one of those things that kids have great imagination. They're able to get outside. They're able to do the things that they want to do on things that teach them about nature and teach them about um, the things that they can build at their own disposal as well. The key to this issue also is the cost. The cost of doing this is actually significantly lower 
then having a piece of play equipment uh, um, is probably about a third of, of doing this kind of treatment for play areas. And the kids find a lot of value in that. Kids find value in it, they find education in it, uh, they find camaraderie in it, they uh, start to uh, 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 compete with each other on the coolest play structure they can build within their own means. And it's really exciting to see how that all kind of works together. And some of the things that you can do is you can kind of mix it up. You can do structured play equipment. And if your budget is a little bit lower, put in, open up that area and start mixing in uh, uh, some of this nature play in with that kind of other play equipment and, and you get something similar to this. This is really exciting. It's a way for uh, both adults to, uh, and kids to kind of learn about things and connect with each other. So we continue to push this idea. The next thing I wanted to talk about, and this is the, the, the last thing was, uh, it was about a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half ago, I got invited to talk, to join a group of people talking about park development. And I got to this, uh, it was in one of the neighborhoods in Chicago, and I got there, and it was down in the basement. This meeting was, was taking place down in the basement, and it was a group of park activists and advocates. And I, was, I, I got there, and I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, this might be kind of like a socialist workers meeting, which is fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but I, I, I started to, to uh, you know, just listen find out what people were talking about. And one of the things that they were talking about was the fact that, particularly with the Chicago Park District, that the Park District was using their land in a way they would rent it out for revenue generation. So these big festivals, this is Lollapalooza in Chicago. This is what it does, you know, after the concert is done. This is what the fields look like. They have to restore this afterwards. Um, but the revenue generation of doing these things is incredible. I mean, it starts to fund all the rest of the other programs throughout the park systems, et cetera. But the advocates were kind of upset about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were upset about this uh, because then it opens up the, it, it, they felt that it, it uh, kind of keeps the residents and the, and the folks that typically would use this park space away from it and, and you're basically renting out this land to the public land to uh, tourists, which in general, that's what was going on. And then, the, you know, subsequently, the other thing that would happen is that the park district would also say, we also have a problem, we don't have the budgets for maintenance as well. So in this particular case, the maintenance is covered by the concert uh, promoters but maintenance throughout all of the entire park system is at a very low end. So they're really having a hard time kind of keeping up with it. This is the you know, stuff that happens after these festivals. What happens is there's trash everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of you know, cleanup that needs to occur. As well as we're finding in our parks, this situation of these homeless encampments that are occurring and quite frankly, with the economic situation that we're in right now, are we going to continue to see more and more of this? And this is another challenge that I think you guys are starting to deal with and, and you know, having some issues with. So I came across this idea. I kept on thinking about this was, you know, you can't pay for this. You're looking for revenue. What happens if we create a brand new currency, a currency based on Bitcoin. So, you know, I was thinking about Bitcoin. Here, my mind is working over time. And I kept on thinking, let's call this part coin. So uh, the idea of this was to develop a new currency that would only pay for two things. And those two things would be, one, affordable housing credits, or two, utility bills. So your power, your gas, uh, maybe your water you know, and sewage, but those were the only things they would pay for. You could not pay for uh, blankets, you can't pay for food with this, you can't pay for anything else. 
and you and you deal with part coin. So how do you earn part coin? You earn part coin by volunteering in the parks. You clean up the parks. So I don't care whether you are at the low end of the economic scale or at your the high end of the economic scale. Anytime you go out into the parks and say you have a little wristband on your wrist that kind of identifies the time you clocked in and the time you clock out, what area you're at. And we all have the technology now to be able to do that. And you log in, you clean up the parks, you have, you do trash pickup, you start to empty the garbage cans, you start to build, you know, uh, do maintenance and painting of the park uh, equipment, you build uh, benches, you, you know, any of these activities that would, your own parks and rec department would kind of figure out that management uh, system. And these volunteers would do it and they would get paid park coin. So park coin then, would kind of supply you, supply these people with an ability to get affordable housing credits or be able to pay their utility bills. So if you're at the high end of the spectrum, who doesn't want their utilities bills paid? I certainly would want to do that. But if you're also, you also want to be philanthropic about it, you give away your park going to the homeless people that needed some affordable housing credits. So you can do with it, this is a currency that you can actually trade, you can uh, do some other things, but it also limits you into the things that uh, would allow you to spend this part coin on. We start to see a lot more volunteerism as we as we get to do this. This is a project in one of the big parks in Chicago, Douglas Park, and these kids decided they wanted to do, create their own mini golf course, and the park system decided, hey, let's do this, set aside a piece of land, and uh, they got a bunch of folks together and taught them how to design this and how to kind of build this. And they are building this right now as we speak. This should be completed in about two weeks. The, 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 the enthusiasm of this, and these kids, quite frankly, are getting paid. They are not learning, they are learning the value of doing something and not, it's not volunteer work. It is, they are getting paid. Um, so we, you know, we continue to say, this is really important for everybody to start to contribute to this uh, effort. It's a way for people to start to gather together. It's a way to start dialogue. And it's a way for people to start, uh, you know, having dialogue with those people who manage things, who have to deal with, um, you know, your civil servants, as well as the, the, the volunteers that come to earn money, uh, you know, or, or learn, earn, uh, real as assets uh, within your parks. So this is one of the things that I've been thinking about for a while. Uh, this is a project that I got involved with and built a small little pocket park in six hours with about 100 volunteers. So this has really uh, been it. Uh, I thank you for your time and I'm opening it up for questions now. Thank you so much.